monthly meeting of the Fedora Council. Usually we try to handle our business uh, asynchronously through tickets and uh, discussion posts. We do have uh, regular business meetings where we you know, conduct business, but every once in a while we want to take some time and have a higher bandwidth discussion with other parts of the project and really give people a chance to um, you know, tell us what they're working on, show off a little bit, and see how the council and the rest of the community can help. So this month, February of 2022, uh, we're talking about the Apple project with Troy Dawson and Carl George. They have some prepared uh, commentary here to start and we'll jump into some Q&A, so I'll turn the floor over to them. Okay, uh, let's share my screen here. Let me know if that's coming through. Looks good to me. Go for it. Okay. Uh, as you said, I'm Troy Dawson, Carl George. Uh, we're both on the Apple Steering Committee. Uh, we usually like to start these presentations with some metrics. We'll keep this short because we only have a few minutes of time. Um, as far as users go, using the unique IP address uh, counting, uh, we're up above 5 million users. Now that's including. Apple 6, 7, and 8, well, and 9. If you do a I, quick, yes? Troy, I, hate, I hate to interrupt you when you just got started, um, but for people who might not be familiar with Apple, can you quickly oh. explain what that is? Okay. Sorry, I, I misunderstood my audience. Uh, let me go back to the screen then so that we can see. Uh, Apple stands for, Enter oh my goodness. Extra packages Extra... for Enterprise Linux. Thank you. I had those backwards, the, the two <laughs> E's. Um, it's packages that are not in RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, that are compiled for them. They're usually 99.9% .9 of the packages are Fedora packages that are compiled on Red Hat Enterprise Linux so that they will run on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. The Apple SIG is basically the group of people helping do that. Uh, we have a steering committee of about eight to 10 people. Uh, I'm the committee chair. Uh, Carl George is also on that committee. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit later about some of the other things Carl is, is relating to Apple. What do we want to tell that now, Carl? It's fine. We got, we can do it when the slide come up, comes up. Okay. Um, thank you for letting us letting us be here on the on the council meeting. Is that I hope that lets you know who we are. Uh, we've been around. This is a fairly old SIG, uh, fifteen years. Uh, been a long time. I, at least fifteen years. We'll say that. I, I wasn't prepared to say how, how old we were. Okay, I'm going to do some metrics. As you can see, we've been around since Apple 5, which would be RHEL 5. I think we might even have some RHEL 4, but. Yeah, there's an Apple 4 GPG key, so I think we've been around since then. Yeah, so it's been pretty early. It wouldn't even surprise me if there was at least discussions with RHEL 3. But I think it formally went with with uh, RHEL 4, starting with Apple 4. Um, as you can see from the graph, we started off slow, and uh, nowadays we're, we're up to over 5 million users uh, doing all of our releases. Uh, a little bit of a breakout for that. Uh, right now, our most popular release is Apple 7. It's it's got the most packages, it's got the most users. And uh, right now we have Apple 9, but it's so small. We're up to 2,000 users, which is actually pretty good considering RHEL 9 isn't released. Uh, so it, Apple 9 is, is our latest one. I, I'm not gonna comment too much more about this in, at the moment, maybe if, People want to ask questions they can later on. 
Uh, so if we do the other graphs were unique IP addresses, there's the new count me system. Uh, but this only has Apple 8 and Apple 9, but Apple 9 again doesn't show up on here more than a blip. So Apple 8, we actually are up to a million and a half, or were up to a million and a half. So if you see on the other page, we weren't even on a million on unique IP addresses, but with the new count me system, we got up to a million and a half. And then there's a little blip. Also worth noting that the this this chart's using the count me system, which is only available for EL8 and EL9. Uh, the mirror stuff has uh, seven, eight, nine, and also the historical ones you saw on that chart. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Right. I'm going to let you talk on these. Sure. So these are some additional charts. Uh, I'm fudging these together. Um, I'm not a data scientist, but I'm uh, tinkering with Matplotlib and making these. Uh, I owe Matthew some work uh, integrating these with his other tools. Uh, so that way we can just generate these at the same time. But uh, we recently launched Apple 9, and it's uh, as you can see, it just starts there in December, and uh, it's already climbing pretty quickly. Um, the, rail, the rail systems you see in that chart, uh, I imagine most of those are the rail 9 beta systems, uh, but there may also be some, some uh, internal deployments of rail that are already consuming Apple. And then we can see that the CentOS Stream 9 systems are already up over 1,000 and still growing. Uh, and mind you, these are just systems that have Apple Apple 9 enabled. Uh, there are probably plenty more. I think in uh, another comparison that uh, Smooch has been working on, I think he's seeing like one out of every five systems as a ratio for uh, systems that have Apple enabled. Uh, I'm interested to see, this is the first time, 9 is the first time we've been able to uh, get that kind of ratio because it's the first time that we have both Apple and the base CentOS distribution in Mirror Manager, uh, reporting those count me statistics for CentOS 8 and CentOS Stream 8, those were on a old, the older CentOS Mirror infrastructure, so we don't have that, that that metric to compare. I'm interested to see if that stays the same over time. I think it'll grow. I think most systems end up having Apple enabled just because of the uh, the small focus set of packages that are in the base distribution. We can move on to the next slide, Troy. So here is uh, Apple 8 systems as opposed to the Apple 9 ones. Uh, as you can see, these are obviously on a much higher scale. Um, the CentOS Linux 8 systems, well, we're reaching up over 500,000 there. Uh, they've dropped off considerably. What we think is happening there is that um, we don't think those systems went away, but with the CentOS Linux 8 early end of life, um, DNF is checking the repositories alphabetically. It hits the AppStream repository first, which is part of the operating system. That's getting uh, 404s from the, the old legacy mirror system, and DNF gives up and stops checking the other repositories, so it stops hitting hitting Apple. We think that's that's our theory about why it's dropping off so quickly there. Um, I don't, I'm not going to kid ourselves and think that people are migrating off of it that quickly. Um, a lot of people are still finding out about that news and migrating slowly, and it'll take some time, but. Um, I think I think that's going to actually spike back up for eight, even though it's end of life, as people find out their mirror, their repos aren't working, and switch over to the CentOS Vault temporarily until they migrate to something else. Uh, but that'll be interesting to keep watching. All the other lines below here are much smaller, but uh, you can see Rel, CentOS Stream, and a lot of the other Rel clones that are coming up. All of them are growing quickly. Uh, I expect them all to keep growing um, as more and more people realize find out about the CentOS Linux eight news. Go to the next slide, Troy. Okay, so we, oh, I'm sorry. Over the past year, that's what sort of what we're going over on the rest of these slides is what has changed over the past year. Uh, one of the things that you might have noticed in these slides is we have a new logo. On the left is our old logo, and uh, that. That worked for the time, but it doesn't scale uh, various things. People didn't even know it was there. Uh, I also on didn't the right, use it in very many places at all. <laughs> nope. I, I had to search to find it. Well, I it's on, saw it on one wiki page. One wiki page. Uh, the new on the right is our new one. Uh, we had 
thank you to the Fedora uh, graphics community helping us work through that. I think it looks pretty good. Oh, also in the last year, uh, Red Hat's views towards Apple has changed. Carl, do you want to go over that or do you want me to? Sure, sure. So the historical context there is that um, RHEL customers have regularly told Red Hat that uh, they don't migrate to a new major version of RHEL until all the packages from third-party repositories, especially Apple, are available. Uh, they understand that everything third-party doesn't get support from Red Hat, but for a lot of the software they use, they don't actually need support for it. They want support for the base operating system, and then they understand that, you know, one or two critical tools that they use, they get from a third party, and it's community-supported at best. But that doesn't change the fact that uh, the availability of that software for each major version affects their plans about when they adopt that major version of RHEL. So Red Hat started taking an interest in that. Uh, enough, enough customers... Uh, gave that feedback that we started, you know, we as in Red Hat started paying attention to that. And uh, for a long time, there was push for the community platform engineering team, the team that me and Troy work on, to take on that work uh, just outright. Um, correctly, our managers pushed back that we'd love to do that. Give us headcount. We're not just taking it on additionally. And in, uh, in September, uh, we announced that that actually happened. We got more headcount approved so that CPE could take on uh, Apple work officially. Um, that doesn't mean that Apple packages are supported in any way. It's just that Red Hat is officially staffing the resources for Apple, uh, kind of in line with how they staff everything, uh, everything that Red Hat provides for Fedora itself. Uh, we're just kind of increasing the, the focus and, and attention that Apple's going to get directly. Um, that is a sub team within CPE. Uh, I was the first member of that. We've since added uh, another CPE member, uh, Diego Herrera. Um, I'm hoping in the future we can add more team members. And even if we, even if the team stays sm small at two, just being part of officially CPE responsibilities makes it a lot easier for everyone in CPE to spend their work time on it uh, ad hoc as needed rather than on their free time, which is historically how Apple always happened. It was always just um, a labor of love, a side project that would happen, you know, weekends and, and, and after hours, and that's how it would usually get, the work would usually get done. Yep. That is paid um, off. Uh, I'll talk about how that's paid off when we get to the Apple 9 slide, but it, it is already paying dividends. Yep. Uh, I do want to clarify, although I, I do work for Red Hat, and although Red Hat is sponsoring some things like Carl, uh, even though I'm the committee chair, I am not a committee chair as part of Red Hat. What am I trying to say, Carl? I'm not paid to be the committee chair. You're an, you're an example of what I was <laughs> talking about. Yeah, you're, you're not, your official responsibilities aren't Apple, but because CPE now officially takes care of Apple uh, and staffs Apple, uh, you don't mind at all putting down that you worked on something Apple as part of your you know routine work uh, rather yep. than doing it on your free time. Yep, yeah. They, is that basically what you're trying to say? That's what I'm trying to say is – uh, I, I work for Red Hat. I work on Apple. I do work on Apple during my red during my work hours and off my work hours, but I am not paid specifically to work on Apple. Now, Carl, you're you are paid to work on Apple, but you're not paid to work on Apple packages. Is that correct? Basically. Um... Although any, you can any, work on them on yeah, your spare time. Any of the Apple packaging work that I'm doing. Uh... That is one thing we wanted to be clear with the community and uh, with uh, other Red Hatters and customers is that um, CPE is not turning into a package delivery service uh, to you know fulfill wish list items for Apple. It is still a community repository. The work is primarily done by community members. And if somebody asks Red Hat to get a package into Apple, their response is, here's how you can do it yourself. Um, that said, with dependencies and interrelated things, there are plenty of thing, plenty of packages that I do work on in Apple to help enable other packages in Apple. I don't want to be a blocker for anything, and that I'd consider that part of the responsibilities. But it's a little bit fuzzy because, like I said, we're not directly just doing a wish list of "Hey, what package do you want? We'll throw them in there." Uh, it's more about enabling uh, community members to add the packages they need and unblocking them when necessary. Uh, 
some of that also involves adding tools that uh, that Red Hatters and, and CPE needs in Apple. Uh, for example, uh, I just wrapped up yesterday. Troy gave me a hand with some of it, uh, getting the Scent Package tool, which uh, rel, develop, rel developers need for building CentOS Stream 9 and doing their daily work there into Apple 9. So that'll let them start dog fooding, uh, stream, running Stream 9 to build Stream 9, uh, hopefully. So that's the main thing is that it's not a package delivery service, but we do do a good bit of packaging just as a matter of supporting it in general. Yep. All right, let's move on. Uh, Fedora Docs. Uh, Apple has had documentation from the very beginning, um, and it's always been on the Fedora Wiki. Wikis are good to a degree, but at some point, they're not. <laughs> uh, we moved to the official Fedora Docs. Uh, that happened this past year. That has made things a lot easier. First, there's no random Wiki pages that people pull up that I've never seen before. And uh, when people do want to have like a change in policy or even just fixing a few words here and there, they can do a pull request uh, and it's made it much easier. One of the other things Carl's also brought it up is we've written a, a nice page that tells people how to get packages into Apple and it looks so much better in docs and it's easier to give them a nice short URL. Rather than explaining it over in time, now we give them a URL that is, I, I describe it as kind of a choose your own adventure guide. Troy, uh, he's not taking enough credit. He wrote most of it. We've <laughs> we've done a few improvements here and there, but it is fantastic. You start at that and you can go through, I am just a user and here's here's how I file the Bugzilla, or I'm a packager, here's how I file a Bugzilla and offer, offer, offer up to be a co-maintainer if the maintainer isn't interested in putting it in Apple and several other scenarios like that. It's really useful. Yep, and, and that's... I think that's helped get more packages in um, because before with, with the wiki, it was fairly vague and we got asked that all the time. Um, anything else on docs, Carl? No, you mentioned that the biggest thing is that now we have the pull request model for improving those, which is huge. Um, yep. And it aligns us with, you know, the rest of Fedora docs, which is always a good thing. Apple yep. is part of Fedora. So doing, Doing our documentation just in the wiki doesn't really fit with what the rest of the project's doing. Okay, Apple, I'm gonna call this Apple Next. Mm -hmm. Carl, since you were the co-create, co-create, you, you were the driving force behind this. I'm gonna let you take this one. Sure, so Apple Next is something we started doing this past year. I think we start launched it in uh, July and uh, to understand what that is, you kind of have to understand the relationship between CentOS Stream and RHEL uh, and how that changed. Historically, CentOS was a rebuild of RHEL, a clone, uh, and the goal was, it, it was never identical, but the goal was to be as close to RHEL as possible. So it would it would follow kind of downstream of RHEL and try and keep all the same library versions and everything identical. That made Apple work, um, you know, it would be very rare for a package to install on RHEL and not on Apple. Uh, it, it would happen occasionally in a short window after a RHEL minor release uh, if a library got changed. Uh, but then all that would have to happen is the Apple packager would rebuild their package, uh, make it compatible with RHEL again, and then there'd just be kind of this weird window, usually about a month, where uh, the, the package may stay broken in Apple so that way it kept working on CentOS, which we know has more deployments than RHEL, and then once CentOS caught up with RHEL, uh, they would do the rebuild in Apple and it would work everywhere. So it would kind of stay broken on RHEL for about a month, which wasn't great. Um, hopefully some of the new rebuilds, they're getting, they're putting more resources into their rebuild work so that, and they're turning around much faster than CentOS had historically. So hopefully that window is shorter for them. But Apple Next is helping with where CentOS moved. Um, CentOS is now just upstream of RHEL uh, it kind of leads RHEL by a minor release. So right now, CentOS Stream 8 has RHEL 8.6 content in it, even though RHEL 8 is still on 8.5. There's not any examples where it's necessary right now, but going back a release, <clears throat> when RHEL was on 8.4 and Stream had 8.5 content, there was a rebase of the Qt5 libraries from 5.12 to 5.15. Um, that happened, like I said, that, that was an 8.5 change. It happened in Stream Stream 8, uh, like four, 
four or five months before it got released in RHEL, and that me meant that everything that linked against Qt and Apple would no longer install on Stream 8. That was not not a good thing. We we were telling people that you know CentOS Stream is still a good operating system. You can still use it. It's not just a development platform, and uh, for most people that's true, and it works great. But then small edge cases like this where an Apple package won't install or any third-party package won't install, uh, it can make things painful whenever RHEL is evolving. So in order to deal with that disparity where CentOS was leading RHEL by about six months, uh, I decided, we came up with this, this idea for Apple Next. Apple itself builds against RHEL, but in order to make compatible packages for these type of changes, uh, we needed a separate build route and separate repository for packagers to target that built against CentOS Stream instead. So now, if you do an irregular Apple 8, a regular Apple 8 build against builds against the current RHEL 8 content, and nine, the vast majority of the time, 99.99% .99 of the time, that works on both RHEL, RHEL, clone, RHEL, RHEL, 8, RHEL 8 clones, and CentOS Stream 8. But when you hit one of those edge cases, like the QT thing, you need to target a different build route, Apple 8 Next, that lets you build stream-compatible packages publish them in a separate repository, and then users can consume those to get uh, a higher version that works on their on their Stream 8 systems. Uh, it also works well for the RHEL 8 betas. Whenever those come out before a minor release, they can users can use Apple Next in order to get compatible packages in the same way. Uh, that's kind of where the, the the name comes from, Next. It's for the next minor release. Um, so, Carl, we launched Carl, that. I, wanna, that sure. I, I wanted to bring up one thing. They don't have to recompile the entire Apple release. It's just those packages yep. that are, are different. The Apple Next thing layers on top of the Apple. So Apple, in order to have Apple Next, you need Apple 8, and then you layer it on top the Apple Next repository. Right. So It's a separate build root, but it's not a completely independent repository. I was working my way towards there eventually. Oh, uh, sorry. No, no, that's great. Keep me on track. We need to hurry. Uh, Yes, for it's a separate build target, but in use, uh, Apple 8 requ Apple requires Apple Next, so you use them together. And most of the time, you won't be using anything from Apple Next because everything in Apple is compatible. But if there's something in Apple that's incompatible, Apple Next allows you to um, get your compatible package if you're on stream, but not if you're not affect the rail users that are using just Apple by itself. So this was the the solution we came up with. Um, it's not perfect. There's a few little kinks with uh, overrides and things like that, but for the most part, it's been really useful. Uh, it helped a lot with 8, RHEL 8.5 readiness, that QT thing, and a, a couple of other changes. And uh, right now, I'm not aware of any big changes between 8.5 and 8.6 where it's even necessary, uh, which just sh shows the point that it is a it's a useful thing when you need it, and you shouldn't need it very often. We've also launched Apple 9 next in conjunction with uh, Apple 9, but it's not, it is also not currently needed for anything, but it'll be there ready once uh, Stream 9 has content that is not in RHEL yet, which will happen uh, probably over the next year or two for sure. Well, let me transition to the next one, because I think that yep. seems like a... Apple 9. How can we have Apple 9 yet if RHEL 9 isn't released yet? Do you want me to answer that, or do you want to answer that? Either way, uh, I can go. So, yeah, like you said, for the for the first time ever, we've launched Apple 9 before the corresponding RHEL version. That was only possible because of CentOS Stream 9. Uh, at this current, we mentioned on the last slide how Apple Next builds against Stream. Um, at this moment in time, Apple 9 and Apple 9 Next build against CentOS Stream 9. Uh, and that is only because RHEL 9 hasn't launched yet. Our intention is, what we plan on doing is freezing the infrastructure mirror of CentOS Stream 9 um, prior to any 9.1 content showing up. Um, we're not, we don't really talk about it exactly publicly, but we are aware of the internal schedules for that and know when we need to do it. The idea is that maintainers don't have to think about it at all. They just target Apple 9 uh, as the general rule, and then some point later on down the road, 9.1, uh, 9.2, if they notice something in Stream, some, one of their Apple, pa Apple 9 packages doesn't install on Stream 9, they can, at that point, Apple 9 will be building against RHEL 9. They can do an Apple 9 next build and get a compatible build the same way they do with 8 now. But at this okay. current moment in time, it's not necessary. So in, in summary, right now, 
build on Apple 9 like you're building on Rails because what what it is is pretty close to Rail GA. Stream 9 right now reflects 9.0 content. Yep. So that's going to help us get a lot of this is a big pressure we had internally. Originally the plan was to launch Apple 9 next uh standalone and leave that for approximately 6 months and then launch Apple 9 after the Rail 9 launch. But explaining to maintainers that that you target Apple 9 next for six months and then you target Apple 9 unless one of these other scenarios, then you target Apple 9 next again. It was just getting way too complicated to explain. Uh, so we kind of revamped our plans and just went ahead and launched Apple 9 outright to keep things simple for maintainers. That has been a big success. We're growing, Apple 9 is growing really rapidly. Uh, as of this morning, uh, it's up over 3,600 RPMs, uh, almost 1,800 source from 1,800 source packages. Over 1,400 updates have gone through Bodhi for Apple 9, and it only launched, I believe, it was first week of December, if I remember right. So yep. it is just growing yeah. faster than we've ever seen before for an Apple release. Um, and yep. like for the first time ever, it launched before the rel, corresponding rel version. Typically, Apple would take uh, three to six months to come along after rel launch. So this is going to help with uh, that third-party ecosystem of packages, having those ready to go day one of rel 9 launch which is which was a big business focus that we were getting input getting the feedback for yep i'm going to move this along carl because we're yep. getting a little short apple 8 uh over the past year uh apple 8 we've already talked about apple 8 next so i'm not going to rehash that mm -hmm. one of the other big things is we recently retired apple 8 playground to be honest, I'm not even going to go over that. It, we Playground was a, a nice attempt, but uh, in the end, nobody was using it, and it was becoming more of a burden. Uh, but that has been decommissioned. In favor of copper, I would say. Most people use that. Oh, that's it's right. Kind of the same spirit of things. Yep, I think, and I think that had already happened as people just started using copper. Yep. Um, I can't see my notes. Carl, do we have any uh, other Apple 8? One of the problems we had with Apple 8 and getting content added was that um, starting oh. in RHEL 8, RHEL was a lot more intentional about what packages were shipped. Um, that's the kind kind way of phrasing it, you know, a focus on what they want, what Red Hat wants to support. Uh, the unkind way to look at that from the community's perspective is Red Hat held back a whole lot of uh, Devil and other packages like that which prevented packages from being added to Apple. Um, that has been a painful experience, but it's getting a lot better. We've got a process ironed out now where um, not you don't even have to be a customer. You can file a Bugzilla. Anyone can, especially Apple packagers, can file Bugzillas to RHEL to request devil packages be included in the uh, CRB repository. Um, that allows that allows Apple packages to build against them rather than just having them in the build route for RHEL packages only. Um, a lot of packages have been added because of that. Um, not all of them. Sometimes the rail maintainers say no. There's a lot of specific nuanced detail about w why they get added or why they why they say yes or no. But on the whole, it's been a positive improvement. Uh, but it started in kind of a bad state. But it's getting a lot better. Um, yeah, I, I think that. Now, oh, I was gonna say I think the that changed about the same time that Red Hat's attitude towards Apple changed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that could all played into the same thing because with uh, with the lack of packages in Apple 8, uh, that kind of brought the focus to customers not wanting to migrate to, from RHEL 7 to RHEL 8. And the answer was the package I need isn't in Apple 8. And then drilling into why that's the case, well, Apple's not staffed and also there's these missing development packages. So it all uh, it all kind of factored into the to where we're at now. Yep. Uh Swinging back to documentation, that page is getting worked on. <laughs> I, we at least have a working draft to make it easier for people to to request those and to fix fix the problem. Yeah, I think right now it's just an FAQ item, and it could probably merits its whole entire page. The okay, only other thing we... was the mock config changes, but I think we can skip those. Yeah, I, I want think... to hit on them real quick. I, I think that's going to. We're getting a little short on time. I'm going to mock config like. changes. Look it up. How's that? <laughs> uh, Apple 7. We still have Apple 7. 
it's still being it's still uh to be honest it's actually still healthy uh people are staying on seven for a long time and uh adding packages updating packages it's a still healthy it's old but it's healthy um maintainers so this is one of the things that um uh, we think will help Apple long term is getting more and more maintainers. Uh, a lot of the maintainers, if you're a Fedora maintainer, it's very easy to become an Apple package maintainer, but not all Fedora maintainers want to have that long term commitment. Uh, we, we did notice, so we got some nice numbers here. Oops, sorry about that. Um, Apple 7, like I said, it's a nice, healthy uh, uh, set of packages being maintained. We've noticed over the years that there's sort of a, a 10, 10 packages per maintainer ratio. That does not mean that every package has 10. Some have hundreds and some have one. But we're trying to get that the number of maintainers for each distribution up. Because more maintainers means more packages, usually means a, a better environment. Even just today, when I was updating for Apple 9, I saw that we had, uh, I think, seven more maintainers than when I updated this just two two weeks ago. So we are growing on maintainers. Uh, it's actually been three months since Apple 9 was released. I should have changed that. But as Carl pointed out earlier when we, he was talking about Apple 9, these other ones, Apple 7 has been around for eight years, Apple 8's been around for three years, and Apple 9 has been around for three months. And it's already almost got half the packages of Apple 8. Uh, Apple 9 is, people are really enjoying it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's one of the great things about having docs online. Um, so anyway, if you want to be a maintainer, whether you're a Fedora maintainer or you're just somebody in the community saying, hey, I'd like to, we're trying to reach out as much as possible. We're trying to make our documentation better. And uh, come come see if you got that package, you really want it in on your rail system, CentOS, Alma, Rocky, come bring it into Apple. You don't need to hide it over on your on your web page or on your separate thing. Uh, as long as it has the right license. Let me clarify that. And doesn't override anything in RHEL. And doesn't override anything in RHEL. We do have some strict policies. rules about being extra packages only. <laughs> yep. Yeah, maybe I need to clear clean up my recruitment statement. Uh, anything else? No, I think that's good. I'm ready for okay. Q&A. All right. Questions and answers. And I'm actually going to cl close this so we can see people. Oops. Anyone have any uh, questions from the audience? Feel free to jump in on video and or voice, or we can put them in the chat and I can read them out. I don't see anyone reaching for the unmute button, so I'll ask a couple that I thought of. Okay. Um, so, you know, you talked about uh, Apple packaging being done by a lot of times the, you know, Fedora packagers of the package in the Fedora or whatever. Um, so what exactly does the Apple SIG do? So there's, there's two, th let me clarify that, the SIG, there's actually two SIGs. There's sometimes we call the Apple Packaging SIG, and that's a little group that we've gotten together of of doing things. But the Apple SIG as a whole, I'll be honest, until six months ago, I didn't know we were a SIG. Um, <laughs> even though I was the, the committee chairman. Um, the SIG as a whole, does yes we do packaging and maintainers that last slide uh 
that is the vast majority of the work done is package maintainers putting building packages in things. So technically, if, if you are a Fedora maintainer and you also uh, maintain something in Apple, we're going to consider you part of our SIG, part of Apple. We don't always call ourselves a, a SIG. We usually just say Apple, the Apple community. Um, Is it a SIG or a subproject? Yes. Yes. We, we're, we're, we, we did have a discussion on whether we were a SIG, and we decided let's just leave it that way because everything's in place, and we don't want to rock the boat on the Fedora side. I would but, say the big thing with the SIG is that we we kind of do we we coordinate the the Fedora re release engineering still handles a lot of our infrastructure side things, um, but there's some overlap in membership between uh, Fedora Releng and the Apple Apple SIG and uh, Apple Steering Committee. And, but I would say the big thing is that the Apple SIG coordinates all the infrastructure and release engineering needed to make Apple happen and have it available for all the packagers to get involved and add the packages they want to see. Thank you, Carl. To be honest, that's a question that nobody's asked me, so I've never even thought of it. It would be good to get some uh, guidelines around, delineate between what does the Apple Apple SIG do versus the Apple Steering Committee versus the Apple the Apple Packaging SIG. We should we should noodle on that some more. Yep. Right now, it's sort of everything. Did you have another second chat. question? Yeah. Oh. Uh, Marie asks in chat, are there ways we can help support your work on Apple? My first idea would be to suggest a survey if that would be useful. So sure. there's, there's several ways to help on Apple. One is documentation. Um, I'm, that's one of the reasons we put things up in Fedora Docs is, is so people could help with that. The other is maintaining packages. Um, so one of the strange things about surveys and stuff, we, we show uh, how many users we have. And to be honest, that doesn't affect most people. Most people working on Apple are doing it because they personally want to do things. Like I personally run the KDE desktop. Um, and so I want to make sure it's the best it can be. And that's what I, one of the main things I do. Or they do things for their company. The company is paying them to do X, Y, and Z. So, so we're not, we, we've, we've talked about surveys before and we just don't know what to ask people. <laughs> unless, unless you think of something that I hadn't, Carl. I would, I would be very interested in a survey. Um, like you, I'm not sure of exact questions and input Helping us come up with survey questions would be very uh, that actually thing for would be the helpful. council to get involved with. Um, I think it'd be okay for the survey to be pretty short. Uh, long surveys get kind of annoying anyways. So, you know, two or three questions would be really good. Um, maybe something, you know, I see Vipple in the chat saying he can help with the survey. Maybe I'll, I need to get with him then and uh, brainstorm a few questions. We can, we, we can talk with you about it too, Troy, and uh, open ideas. But yes, getting more intelligence about what um, what Apple maintainers and uh, I should just say Fedora maintainers because part of the things that I would ask, I would target the survey uh, at Fedora maintainers and ask, you know, how many of them participate in Apple? If they don't, why not? Um, things like that. That would be useful intelligence so that way we can uh, we can help shape policy and our, our focus in the future to get convert more, get more of those Fedora maintainers involved in Apple as well. So I see another question in the chat, and I'd really like to address this one. Um, so can you speak a bit on the expected support lifetime of Apple packages versus Fedora packages? This is in regards to maintainer support. Now, it's in the policies, and a lot of people miss this, and maybe we need to bring it up. But an Apple packager only needs to maintain a package as long as they want. A lot of people, and we do stress that, to be honest, we, we would we'd like you to stay the whole lifetime of RHEL. And there is the API support thing. But if you 
change jobs and do things. Or let's say I switch from KDE to XFCE. Probably not going to happen, but let's say we did that. Um, you, to be honest, this is something that I wanted to bring up in the community. Uh, we'd like to get something similar to an orphan, but not an orphan, something where you can say, hey, I'm no longer going to maintain this, because right now the Apple policy basically says you can drop it. Um, it doesn't happen very often because because they need to maintain the API support, a lot of Apple packages just sit there. A lot of the Apple 7 packages have not been rebuilt or done anything for the whole life of mm -hmm. the thing. The idea is uh, kind of to maintain Apple packages in a similar fashion to RHEL itself. Yep. But if you do security want security updates only, um, and only update doing avoiding major upgrades, version changes if possible. Um, anyway, the, the way the policy currently is worded, you can drop something if you want. We suggest you bring it up on the Apple Devel and say, hey, I want to drop this. Can anybody take it? Otherwise, I'm going to retire it. Um, but you but you can. Which is similar to how it works for Fedora Rawhide. It's just for Fedora, you're not allowed to, by policy, you're not allowed to retire packages in the general case from a from a stable release once it makes it in there. So. Retiring a package on Fedora, in Fedora means you keep maintaining, like right now, your F35 and F34 packages until they're end of life, and then you can retire it on, on Rawhide. Um, I'm not sure how that works with branched. I imagine at some point it, that policy takes effect for the branch release as well. But uh, with Apple, due to, you know, Fedora releases have you know, a roughly 13-month life cycle, so, um, ten, you know, Saying, hey, make sure to maintain, you have to keep maintaining it for the remaining 13 months is not a big deal. Saying you have to keep maintaining it for the remaining 10 years of this life cycle is a lot bigger ask, so we don't do that. Or don't mandate that, per se. Definitely appreciate it when I, and recommend it. Right. I hope I hope that answered. Um, was there, Ben, did you have another question? I had another question, yeah, and this is one I could uh, easily probably search for myself. But does Apple offer flat packs, or is it just RPMs at this point? It is just RPMs. We do not. Um, as far as I know, we don't have the infrastructure to do flat packs. Also, I don't, do be the value. I don't think there'd be any value there either, because um, Fedora flat packs, the Fedora flat pack remote, and um, what, what do you call it? Uh, Flat Hub, those work on RHEL as far as I know, and they pull in their necessary run times. Uh, kind of the whole point of Apple is to rebuild Fedora source uh, Fedora sources for the RPMs on a compatible release of RHEL because they don't have like flat tap flat pack runtime libraries. Um, since flat pack kind of brings its own runtime, that's that's just not necessary. Any other questions? Well, I would like to say we appreciate the support that Fedora has given us over the years. Um, I'd also like to thank the, as far as I know, this is the first time we're in here. I'm the current committee chair, but there's committee chairs and council members before both me and Carl that I think this past year we're reaping the benefits of past Apple people's works. Um, they've been pushing the rock up a hill for a long time, and we just happened to get to the top, and we're we're going with what you do. So those of you who are forebears, thank you. Talking about you, Smooch, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I didn't want to name a name, but uh, he's done a lot. There's also been others with him. Uh, yes. Kevin, Kevin has been, been pushing that rock for a long time, too. Yes. Shut all credit where credit's due. Kevin and, Kevin and Smooge are great. Uh, several others, of course. Uh, those are the two most notable as far as when we're talking about it in a historical long term, pushing that rock up the hill. I think they've probably been doing it the longest, I would say. Yeah, I think so. 
I, I think they were part of the original Apple group. And I know Kevin was, I think Smooge was. Oh. That kind of fits in with what we were talking about, how it kind of, uh, historically it's been a kind of a spare time thing for release engineering just to, uh, they're kind of the blocker on getting the infrastructure up so the repo can exist and the build targets and all that stuff. Um, but that was, you know, that was kind of the end of the involvement, get it up and running and then uh, let the maintainers take over and do what they need to do. So uh, release engineering supported us really well in, in that way, doing it in their spare time. And now with C, with uh, Apple being a staff CPE initiative, now they can, you know, they can block out their calendar with stuff and say, hey, I'm working on this official CPE initiative today. And that's uh, that's helped a lot. So it's great. Well, I, we appreciate your time uh, and all of your effort, Troy and Carl. Thanks for joining us today. Our next uh, video council or council video meeting will be on March 10th, uh, and we'll be keeping on the enterprise Linux theme. Uh, we'll have Stephen Gallagher and Justin Forbes here to talk about the uh, enterprise Linux next dig. So tune in for that uh, live on Blue Jeans or catch us later on YouTube. So with that, uh, thank you again, and we'll see everyone on the internet. Later, y'all. Thank you.